So yeah, good morning also from my side. My name is Alexander Schleich and I'm heading uh, what is called a junior research group in the uh, cluster of excellence uh, data integrated simulation science here in Stuttgart. And basically, so what you've seen yesterday already in Christoph's nice overview talk is that uh, with Espresso, you can uh, create a lot of uh, uh, artful cover images. Uh, basically, this is all more or less polymeric systems. And what I'm trying to show you today is basically how we can write these uh, algorithms uh, that Christian just introduced uh, and these systems to also kind of energy materials. This is, of course, also the, the topic of this school. So it's really going from charged of matter to, to energy materials. And this is a small outlook. Of course, I have to start a bit about what is uh, soft matter. I will give a very, very brief uh, overview in coarse graining, and this I uh, exemplary show in uh, with polymers. So then we do a bit of uh, Professor Boltzmann theory, and then really go to uh, um, energy storage materials, and then really go to the limit of coarse graining, uh, where we just coarse grain a polymer to a charged rod. Yeah. So this is the outlook. So. Um, as we're doing uh, simulations here, the school is basically on Espresso, and you see it's really the uh, simulation package for research on soft matter, and probably it's even probably even the the uh, simulation package for soft matter. So the question, of course, is what is soft matter? Um, I mean, the the standard answer I tend to give is it's everything that is not hard. Yeah. So uh, soft matter is really something deformable, somehow uh, uh, not very stiff. And you can even go a bit further in, in quantifying this. And this is just taken from uh, Wikipedia. It's a subfield of condensed matter uh, where you have a very uh, variety of physical states. And I mean, the, char the characteristics is that everything is related to thermal energy. And the nice thing in soft matter is really that it bridges very different communities, very different fields ranging from physics, chemistry, biology, or also a, a material science, which somehow this nice uh, graph doesn't include yet. So, but that's the, the basic philosophy behind the uh, soft matter. And um, I mean, okay, why is it soft? Uh, it characteristics uh, has characteristics both of the liquids and uh, solids. So, which means if you look uh, closer, uh, um, okay, that's just historically, the name was uh, termed some 30 years ago uh, by Dijen. And I mean, these liquid properties uh, mean that basically soft matter, it always has some measurable viscosity. And the uh, uh, this means also that uh, you have, can also have elastic deformations. So this is uh, basically the somehow the uh, uh, condensed property. So they end up with some viscoelastic behavior here. Yeah, and this is just a few examples of soft matter. So uh, ranging from rubbers, foams, gels, uh, foams, yeah, you probably have tried uh, yesterday, uh, typical beer foams, but you also have a, a lot of soft matter in uh, biological systems, basically going up to blood cells, proteins, or so cells. This is all typical ranges of soft matter. Uh, and I mean, this is also of large uh, material science interest. So you can have smart materials, actuators, sensors, crystals, tra -la -la, all these uh, 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 tools. And very importantly, it's probably the model system for statistical physics. So soft matter is where you really can do elementary statistical physics, test it both in simulations, experiments. So that's really uh, a strong interplay here. Okay, only very briefly a word on length scales. So, I mean, this is basically uh, uh, ranging from the smallest to the uh, largest length scales, so the size of the universe. And then you see basically soft matter is here in this uh, range where we are uh, a bit larger than typical atoms, uh, but uh, much smaller than uh, our everyday life. And uh, let me zoom a bit in this. So we still cover several orders of magnitude with self matter, basically typically going from a nanometer regime to uh, uh, several tens or several hundreds of micrometers. So that's the typical length scale. And I mean, in these length scales, you also find a lot of different materials again. So smallest length scales, we talk really about molecules here, a methane molecule or DNA. You can have these actin fiber networks that you find in cells. Then on hundreds of nanometers, you typically find bacteria. Yeah, So this is a bacteriophage. Then you go to blood cells in the micrometer range. And I mean, the smallest length scale there in hundreds of micrometers, typically where you would talk about soft matter is basically the size of a hair. Yeah? 
Okay, so why do we do cross craning now? It's because basically not all interactions can be included on our level. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously if you try to solve a Schrodinger equation on a quantum mechanical level. So this is ideally what we want to do for all systems, all times. Uh, but it's uh, just infeasible. So you uh, would typically go to atomistic simulations, but uh, really if you want to cover the full length and time scale that you want to have in soft matter, you uh, basically need to also go to this mesoscopic scale and you go there by basically cost craning. So this means that you really uh, neglect individual degrees of freedom step by step and you replace them by effective interactions. Yeah? And so this is really depicted here. So you reduce this number of freedoms, you introduce some effective interactions. And I mean, this is uh, done on, on several levels, several steps. So the first would be really from going off from solutions of Schrödinger equations to this uh, atomistic view where you basically treat atoms and effective forces between them. Next step would be then, of course, the course training. And then the uh, where you would go basically to a molecular and then to a mesoscopic scale where you step by step also neglect some fluid interactions. And then finally, you would end up on a continuum scale. Okay, let me go now to uh, basically an application of uh, coarse graining and uh, typical coarse graining you would do for polymers. Polymer mean, means just uh, you have something composed out of many parts. So you typically uh, uh, have a, a monomer, uh, for example, ethylene here, and then you have some reaction and then you create a polymer, polyethylene of a certain length. Uh, so you have these many interactions. And I mean, polymers are basically known since around 100 years. And uh, there's a lot of uh, successful uh, physicists, chemists uh, involved in this history, uh, not a lot of uh, Nobel Prizes to win, as you see. And uh, I mean, the, the basic idea then is, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is just some more examples. Um, so uh, very fast developments in this uh, field of polymer science. Uh, after 10 years of polymer science, you basically already had the first commercial products that we're still using today. And I mean, the, the uh, Every one of you hopefully knows plastics. Plastics is basically something that is able to be modeled. And I mean, this is a field of polymers after 100 years is uh, still not uh, dead. But uh, we're going really to uh, new systems, organic electronics, solar cells, uh, polymer batteries is everything very important. And I mean, uh, um, even more recent people work on semiconducting polymers, electrochemical transistors, and so on. So. Um, how do we now actually cost grain a polymer? And I mean, the uh, first step in, uh, or the simplest way to use uh, view a polymer is to describe a polymer as an ideal chain. And uh, I mean, basically this is by, uh, by done by assuming that you have only local interactions between your monomers. So you have uh, described your polymer as a random walk. So you say you start with your first atom at some position, then do you do a random step, you end up another position and so on. And when you do this, uh, the nice thing is that you can uh, write down uh, uh, some observables analytically and typically the first observable you would be interested in when doing polymer science is this end-to-end -end vector. Uh, where you just basically sum up all the vectors. So you've asked, okay, how far is the distance between atom zero and atom n? And then you would be interested in doing this in an ensemble average to really get the statistical meaningful uh, insight here. And when you do this, you can write down actually the uh, exact re uh, result because you can write down the random walk. Uh, and if you do this in 1D, um, this is still a rather boring result because you see that in 1D, the average end-to-end -end distance will be zero. But uh, luckily, uh, we don't live in only one dimension. Yeah? So in one dimension, if you walk randomly back and forth, on average, you will not move. But the nice thing is, if you do exactly the same in three dimensions, you uh, will up, end up with some expression that gives you a finite uh, extension of your chain. And um, this is basically uh, exactly given by this uh, Gaussian expression here. Um, there's only uh, uh, one thing that uh, you need to be aware of is basically you have a finite extension probability at distances larger than the sum of these distances, which means it's a, a slightly unphysical behavior in this limit of infinite uh, extension here. Okay, now we have created a, a, a polymer model. 
Of course, this is not the only way to do it. You can also say, okay, you have non-local interactions in your polymer backbone. Uh, then you can uh, come up with different models. So this would mean, for example, a self-avoiding walk, um, but this will uh, is getting too specialized and we will not do here. Um, but we will really stick with this representation of Gaussian polymers. And I mean, for example, what you would uh, look at here is a Gaussian polymer in a theta solvent, which means that actually the interaction between your uh, uh, monomers would be exactly of the same kind as with your uh, uh, solvent background. Yeah? And that's the typical basis of uh, uh, what we use in simulations, because then we write down a bead spring model of the polymer, so we, which means we have basically uh, these uh, bead particles, and we are just at a harmonic bond between these beads. And what is nice is we can then write down in statistical mechanics exactly the partition function of this problem. And what we end up with is exactly the same partition function as the random walk model. Yeah? So this is exactly what I've shown before. So we now have a computational model to exactly describe this uh, random walk of the polymer. So that is basically the philosophy behind such a cost training procedure. And of course, this is not the only kind of a solvent uh, that we can treat. We can also uh, describe uh, the solvent properties here. Um, so uh, for example, we can have a good solvent, so which means the monomers like the solvent more uh, than the other monomers. So then you would uh, basically uh, it, it prescribe these monomer interactions via a WCA uh, potential that um, Woodolf introduced yesterday, or uh, and then basically uh, you would also tend to avoid this unphysical extension of the spring if you really use a Gaussian polymer. So you could have some other potentials here with some finite extension. Yeah. Okay. Let me skip this. So this is basically the uh, philosophy of polymers. You can all tune your solvent properties by playing with some Leonard Jones interactions. So what this is really then more or less uh, details. But let me now uh, uh, switch a bit from this philosophy of cost training. I will come back to this in the end of my talk again to really uh, uh, these uh, charged systems that we now uh, want to focus on here. And the first question you would ask yourself is, what is actually the origin of surface charges? Yeah? So where do they come from? What uh, 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 do they mean in your system? Yeah? And I mean, there's basically two very fundamental uh, effects where you can create, uh, how you can create surface charges. The one uh, is basically you could have at your sur interface at your surface, some dissociation or ionization of some surface groups that actually creates a, a corresponding surface charge. Uh, so this is really a chemical reaction. The other way to create surface charges would correspond typically to preferential adsorption or uh, desorption of uh, charged species. So uh, this is, for example, shown here. Yeah, the, you have some uh, uh, ions that tend to uh, dissociate here, and this is the preferential adsorption. So I'm sorry, the figures just popped up in exactly the wrong order. Um, so you would here adsorb these silver ions or chloride ions to the corresponding electrodes. And then basically here, this shows if you have a functional group, how this would dissociate into a charged species here. Huh? Okay, what, uh, uh, why is this important at all? It's because basically these uh, electrostatic surface charges, they are the driving force for all, uh, more or less all uh, colloidal stability and self-organization problems on these length scales. So uh, how the, the fine interplay of these interactions results in uh, effects like creaming, sedimentation, flocculation, or coalescence. And uh, even more importantly, it is basically the one of the two uh, uh, fundamental stabilization forces. Yeah? So you have basically a charge which uh, uh, separates your, uh, 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 your entities, or you could have some steric stabilization. Yeah? So really steric constraints that uh, um, your particles don't bump into each other. Yeah? So these are the two very fundamental uh, uh, stabilization effects. Um, so I already introduced a bit the concept of coarse craning. So the uh, uh, next logical step is, can we also cross grain electrostatic interactions? Yeah, and I mean, um, so Christian already briefly mentioned this. So uh, typically what you do is you assume your solvent, yeah, most relevant solvent, both in polymer science, also in, in terms of biology uh, uh, and many applications is water. Yeah. 
So you would like to get rid of all the water degrees of freedom. You replace it by a simple dielectric background. So you get rid of all these degrees of freedom. You just have, say, you, I have some uh, relative dielectric constant here. And I mean, next step in cost graining is basically you replace all your molecules, your ions, uh, by point charges of some uh, valency, yeah? And you assume you would have no other interactions than the electrostatic ones, yeah? So this is a very um, fundamental step in coarse graining. And when you do so, you can actually write down the Coulomb energy. Yeah, you see you have your relative dielectric background here. And um, Christian already introduced the Brearum lengths, yeah? So, uh, which is basically... Uh, the uh, distance at, when, uh, at which two elementary charges interact with the same energy as the thermal energy. And uh, just uh, because you see this often in literature and also on, uh, I guess, some of my slides, uh, you often introduce this abbreviation where you just say epsilon. It's basically the product of the uh, vacuum permittivity and the relative permittivity here. Okay, when you do so, uh, you would... In a Stutnik uh, sense, uh, Stutnik notation, uh, usually write down uh, the Gibbs free energy and try to minimize this. So uh, basically, you have two terms in the Gibbs free energy, which is uh, all electrostatic interactions. So I just have here a Coulomb energy for all of these terms. And then the second term is basically the ideal gas free energy, because I assume I have point lag particles that do not interact differently than. Uh, uh, via electrostatics. And when I try to minimize this, this is uh, in general a very challenging approach, but I can do something uh, um, which is uh, uh, called the mean field approximation. So I uh, assume now I really have some of my charged particles here. I have a problem that I uh, want to solve. And when I now uh, assume that each charge only feels the average charge uh, of all the other particles, yeah, then I can uh, really uh, uh, minimize this free energy and solve this electrostatic problem. Yeah, So I actually assume I have ele an electrostatic potential, which is the average electrostatic potential due to all other charges in the system. Yeah, And when I uh, uh, minimize then using this expression, this uh, free energy expression, then I uh, end up with a Boltzmann distribution. So I can calculate this distribution of my charged species, which is basically given by the equilibrium distribution, and then this Boltzmann factor where I have the local electrostatic potential. So that's the uh, uh, big step, basically, how to cross grain these interactions and how to this, uh, uh, get some meaningful uh, insights from this. Um, let me come back to this uh, problem of uh, uh, colloids then, colloidal stability. So imagine you want to have a look now at these uh, uh, colloids in some uh, solution. So how would they stabilize? How would they interact? So um, what you uh, do is several approximations then to really obtain a cell model. So basically you decompose this uh, uh, problem into a problem of uh, uh, many single particle interactions. Yeah, So you go from N interacting particles to the picture where you have N particles that interact only with the mean potential of the other particles. And then typically you replace uh, the surrounding by some effective boundary condition, uh, um, which is uh, uh, usually in uh, uh, 3D, it's a sphere, because then you know that uh, uh, because of electrostatics, your electric field should decay to zero at these interfaces, yeah? And then you can really uh, uh, solve this Possible Boltzmann cell model here, and uh, uh, you have derived basically an interaction between single particles instead of the N particle problem, yeah? So that is really this uh, way how you treat this. Okay. Um, what do we do now with this uh, Possible Boltzmann theory? We uh, really use uh, this mean potential and we insert uh, uh, this into the Boltzmann distribution. And what we get then here uh, uh, is we want to solve the Possible equation, uh, which is uh, just a second order differential equation. So we can plug this in. And when we plug this in, we get a different second order differential equation here in this Boltzmann distribution. And what I also wrote down here is this uh, external or fixed charge distribution, which would correspond to some surface charge of your system. Yeah? So this is the famous Fosso-Boltzmann equation. 
uh, where you basically have some positive species, some negative species of the valency nu plus and nu minus, and then uh, you solve this, and then basically you know how your ions would be distributed in the system. There's a few approximations that is very important to, to reiterate and reiterate again. So uh, when you use Professor Boltzmann theory, you assume point-like ions, so you would have no excluded volume. It's a mean field approach, yeah? so because every particle only sees the average potential of all other particles, so uh, there are no correlations between particles. And uh, uh, this uh, immediately fails, basically, if you as soon as you have a valency of your ions that is larger than one. Yeah? And uh, it still is a second order elliptic partial interferential equation. So uh, you find closed solutions for only for very selected few simple examples. Um, which is uh, uh, planar walls in the limit of only counter ions. You can solve it for cylinders, uh, but not much more. Yeah, uh, And of course, there's many extensions possible to basically uh, get rid of these strong artifacts. You can uh, include finite sized ions, dielectric effects. You can include on some level, again, uh, correlations and, and plug this in, but it's basically all in a more or less phenomenological way. OK. So um, one uh, important simplification, just in, in, in writing down this equation, you can obtain if you really now focus on this 1-1 one, one electrolyte, where you assume that the valency is uh, plus minus 1. And this is basically the range where Professor Boltzmann uh, is uh, good at anyway. And uh, then we again go uh, to a reduced potential. Yeah, So we basically uh, introduce this potential, which is just rescaled by the thermal energy. And when you do so, you end up with this a uh, 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 bit nicer looking way of the Professor Boltzmann equation, where you have this parameter kappa, you have this uh, uh, sine, uh, hyperbolic sine function, and uh, this kappa square is basically related to the equilibrium concentration. And I uh, will show you in a second, basically, some physical interpretation of this. Okay, the nice thing is when we write down the Postel Boltzmann equation like this, we immediately know that we can uh, um, linearize for small potentials here the, the uh, sinh function, which gives you then this expression. And this is valid based, uh, obviously if this uh, uh, potential is smaller than one, or if I go to physical units again, if the electrostatic interaction in the energy is small to the thermal energy. And what I then get, is an exponentially screened solution of this differential equation here with some characteristic uh, screening length one over kappa. And this basically, this length is called the Debye screening length. So it's basically the uh, range of electrostatic interactions in the, in the salt. So basically after this uh, screening length, all electrostatic interactions have decayed to one over E. And uh, that's basically one uh, of the very important uh, um, characteristic length scales appearing in these soft and matter systems. Yeah? And as you see, this uh, uh, length scale, it depends like one over the square root on the concentration here. And uh, just to give a few numbers, if you have a one molar uh, salt in water, you just typically three angstrom, it's a nanometer for a hundred molar salt. Or if you go to pure water, uh, because you have water auto-ionization, you, so you have some H3O plus, some OH minus in your water, you end up with a length scale of a micrometer for this. Yeah? Okay, so uh, we have now uh, basically already collected two characteristic length scales. So I will take this short here. So we have the BRM length that we have uh, introduced now already twice, uh, uh, which is basically the, uh, with the resistance area you have the electrostatic interactions equal to thermal energy. And uh, uh, in water, Christian already mentioned this, this is typically seven angstrom. In vacuum, this would be 55 angstrom. And uh, because the dielectric constant, for example, here in water, it depends on can temperature. Also, uh, you should be aware that the uh, VRM length, uh, in fact, depends on, on temperature. OK, the second characteristic length scale uh, we just learned is the uh, Debye length. So, uh, uh, what we can do now is we can really uh, solve this cell model. So assuming a spherical macro ion uh, of a radius A, uh, uh, and then calculate actually the the um, the interaction between two uh, of these uh, colloidal particles. And what you get then is basically this uh, 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 exponentially screened Coulomb interaction. 
And uh, again, here uh, is the Debye length appearing. And what you see is basically that the co and counter ion concentrations, they decay exponentially uh, uh, with the distance from these colloidal particles to their bulk value. Um, yeah, and this is basically, if you really now combine this Yukawa-like potential uh, with some uh, uh, stabilizing interaction, typically a van der Waals uh, force um, for your colloids, then you get, really get this famous uh, stability curve that was uh, uh, derived in the 30s and 40s by uh, the Yaugen, Landau, Fave, and Overbeck. So you have this competition between electrostatic repulsion between charged particles and van der Waals attraction, which gives you this uh, uh, nice stable minimum that is uh, a bit hard to see in the uh, coloring here. Um, and uh, I mean, what you do typically in the simulations, instead of using this uh, hamaker type interaction here, you would uh, uh, use some uh, Leonard Jones or Buckingham potentials typically. Okay, of course you can now uh, ask, we did all of this uh, uh, cost graining. So a logical question is how good actually is this implicit solvent uh, uh, approximation? And uh, this is a re simulation result now uh, uh, with the interaction energy between chloride-chloride, uh, uh, sodium-chloride and sodium-sodium. And you see uh, basically this is what you get from this cost grain model. And uh, basically uh, uh, what becomes clear is as soon as you're uh, talking about characteristic length scales of about a nanometer, then this implicit solvent description obviously is not very bad, yeah? And if you really want to resolve finer details, you see that you have to include some more atomistic views. Okay, um, I said only very few analytical solutions and one of these solutions uh, 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 that has been first obtained by Gui and Schapman uh, in 1910 is uh, actually uh, the uh, solution in the salt-free limit for a single charge plate. So what you write down is the one-dimensional Peyer-Hosser-Boltzmann equation, and uh, then you plug in the corresponding boundary conditions. So you have the surface charge, which basically gives you the slope at the uh, interface, and you assume that at infinity, your electrostatic uh, field decays to zero. And then you basically get this uh, solution here with this parameter lambda again, and uh, this is another very important length scale appearing. So that's the uh, so-called gui Schapman length, which basically tells you at which distance from the charge plate your interactions have decayed to a typical value. Yeah? And uh, what you see again here appearing is the surface charge, the valency, and the Bierum length. So yeah, some old uh, friends in the meanwhile, I hope for you. And uh, then you can just plug in again uh, into the Posso uh, equation and get the uh, ion density and the uh, integrated ion density. Yeah? So you can integrate this ion density to really see how this uh, charge evolves. And when you do this is uh, that when basically uh, you look at how many charges, how many of your charge is within this uh, gui Schapman length, then you see that half of your uh, ions in the system will be located within a distance of this gui Schapman length. So you have a strongly localized uh, counter ion distribution. And this is actually uh, what uh, then a few years later, uh, Stern motivated to describe this uh, uh, surface capacitance with a, a, a typical Stern layer. So you have, don't have this pure gui Schapman solution, but you would consider a fixed distribution of ions here where the field just drops linearly and then solve with this effective equation. Yeah, So that's the uh, um, idea here. Okay, obviously we can do uh, some linearization again. I mean, we can always uh, do the math for this. So we uh, linearize uh, the Poisson-Boltzmann equation in 1D again. So you get the corresponding ion distribution. But what you see is that you in this case get an exponential rather than an algebraic decay. So basically uh, what you see here is that linearization for the charged plate uh, will more or less always fail. Yeah? Uh, and you see that you typically overestimate the ion density by a factor two. Yeah? So even for small sigmas, typically this linearization here is not very good. Okay, so with this now we have basically derived some fundamental tools to really go to uh, applications. So uh, um, this is basically the uh, double layer capacitor where you really apply some uh, uh, voltage. So you want to store some energy, some charge here. And uh, uh, we have already seen now this so-called Gui-Japman-Stern model. So the idea is you have here 
in this uh, inner Helmholtz plate, IHP, uh, you have some strongly localized uh, solvent molecules. Uh, then you have this stern layer where you have basically in, within this gui Chapman length, this strong localization. Uh, this characterizes your outer Helmholtz plate. And then uh, further above uh, or further away from the interface, you basically have this uh, 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 algebraic screening that you would get from solving the gui Chapman problem. Yeah? Um, in general, you find uh, barely find uh, uh, or there's no close solution in the presence of uh, salt, and everything depends, of course, also on interfacial de details. But within this Gabriel Chapman, so you only have counter ions, uh, um, you can uh, solve this. And then, if your two interfaces are far away, so you can assume basically that um, the field vanishes between your uh, double plate capacitor. So you can then just use additivity of these potentials and then calculate the total electrostatic potential. So that's the full idea here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just another figure illustrating the the stern layer here. Um, so now we really look at energy storage. So uh, what is the characteristic uh, uh, property you want to look at if you now really want to charge? Uh, your porous material, your electrode material, and then uh, use the energy in, in discharging. So the important characteristic is always this differential capacitance. So how does your surface charge that you store in the system uh, depend on the applied potential? And now, I, uh, now here we have the solution. Uh, uh, we can solve this within the gui Chapman uh, model. Uh, exactly the relation between the surface charge and the surface potential. And this is also known as the Graham equation. So you see this complexly uh, depends as a sine, a sine a hyperbolic sine again. And uh, uh, we can, of course, again, linearize this with all the problems I just mentioned. And that's just a, a result that you would get then. So you have the uh, surface potential, you have the surface charge, and you see within this very, very small surface potential limit, you can do the linearization and then get the differential capacitance here from deriving this expression, yeah? So uh, just this is uh, uh, that you see basically everything I told you is uh, not very recent. So uh, this idea of prescribing the double layer capacitor or describing a double layer capacitor is based on Helmholtz in the 1850s. So uh, uh, really old ideas. Uh, then we had Gui and Chapman's uh, with this uh, 1D model uh, in the early and uh, 20th century. Uh, Deba and Hückel a bit later, Stern, Graham. Yeah? So you see, this is the evolution. It's basically all in the first part uh, of the last century. And then basically the second part of the last century dealt with how we can actually extend this. So people realized that uh, dielectric constants, uh, uh, surface specific effects in the vicinity of interfaces are important to consider and uh, uh, how you can incorporate finite sized ions into these models and so on. Yeah? So that is basically uh, uh, what people are working on since the second half of the last century. Yeah, okay. Systematic shortcomings are the same. So ions are treated as point charges. You assume a homogeneous isotropic dielectric background and you uh, do completely neglect all solvent layering, polarization and so on. So solvent is just a homogeneous medium again. Um, let me uh, uh, only briefly introduce to you here, uh, uh, I mean, these concepts of interfacial uh, uh, electrostatics. So uh, uh, we start again with the Coulomb sum, and now uh, we have this coarse-grained interaction again, but uh, now this uh, dielectric constant here, of course, it uh, has a certain symmetry, so we have to consider actually the full uh, tensorial uh, uh, quantity here. And uh, uh, I mean, because of symmetry, it has only two independent uh, uh, components, so the perpendicular and the parallel uh, component. And then everything you need to do is uh, do a bit of uh, classical Maxwell equations, uh, which tells you that uh, uh, basically in the normal direction, the uh, um, uh, uh, in the normal direction, the uh, 
uh, the field is constant and in the parallel direction, the E field must be constant. And I'm only telling you this without going into further details because it tells you that uh, you get, uh, when you solve these electrostatic problems, you get uh, uh, once basically a relation for the parallel dielectric constant. And because of these uh, symmetry conditions, you would also get some relation for the inverse perpendicular dielectric constant. Yeah, So what you get here. Yeah? And we can now do simulations of these systems uh, and uh, see actually how well or uh, how bad these uh, homogeneous approximations are. So you see, uh, if you just look at the density profile, so this is water between graphene walls, and you see you have these strong density oscillations, which obviously are not captured within a homogeneous distribution. And uh, then you see also that, uh, I mean, it's not very bad for the uh, parallel dielectric constant, but if you really want to solve the Posso equation, uh, the Posso Boltzmann equation here, you would need to include this uh, inverse uh, the perpendicular dielectric constant. And you see that this has a lot of interfacial effects, and you can try to invert this. And then you see you even have this uh, poles close to the interface, which you somehow need to, to incorporate. Okay, um, can we use this insight now to uh, actually? Uh, better describe the capacitance of such double layer capacitors? The answer is yes. Um, we can just write down a modified Poisson Boltzmann approach where we really use now this uh, position dependent displacement field with the dielectric profile that we plug in here. And uh, I mean, uh, this is the solid lines here. So for uh, some hydrophilic and hydrophobic uh, model systems that we did in simulations. And you see then if you compare this just to the bulk homogeneous dielectric constant, you are already off typically by an order of magnitude. And basically these uh, uh, results that you get when you include these interfacial effects, they get much more into the uh, uh, range where you have experimental data, which is these points here. And then the second improvement you can do, you can include actually uh, some ion specific effects where you just fit some surface interaction here. And then you basically get these dashed lines. So you can basically really explain here systematically how to improve such Poisson Boltzmann approaches to uh, uh, the uh, capacitance that you measure in experiments. Okay. Last uh, uh, task bit of theory I'm showing you is basically now. I have this confined system. I have the interaction between point charges. I now know that my uh, um, dielectric constant uh, is tensorial. So uh, what I want to solve is the tensorial uh, Green's function for this problem. Um, so I uh, solve this with the uh, symmetry of my planar system. And what I get basically then is this uh, expansion here in a series where again, I have something that is related to the dielectric contrast that Christian introduced. And what I can do is I can simply take the limit of uh, uh, where a metallic uh, surface, and then I end up with a series. Yeah? Um, you, we can discuss any details, but what is important here is uh, that for small separations, when you take this limit, then actually this first term dominates. So you kind of end up with this normal Coulomb interaction, one over R. But if you take the large distant limit, actually the series expansion here is uh, dominating and uh, you end up with some exponentially screened uh, interactions. So uh, uh, your uh, interactions will not decay with a Coulomb law in this uh, case when you have a narrow slit here with metallic interfaces, but you rather exp expect some exponential screening between these interactions. Yeah? And um, yeah, this is basically showing this. So this would be a standard Coulomb law in a log-log plot. It's just a linear line. You have the metallic limit. And then even if you include really these uh, insights from atomistics, you would end up with this uh, uh, transition here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last five minutes, I will try to spend on uh, the last uh, cost reading per procedure because you will need this uh, uh, this afternoon in the tutorial. So. Um, we come back to a polymer. We said we uh, want to cross grain polymer interactions and um, we want to cross grain it as far as possible. And if you do this, uh, you end up with the limit of uh, um, cross graining where you just uh, assume your charged polymer is an infinitely thin charged rod. And uh, um, then again, you can write down the Poisson Boltzmann equation. Um, you introduce a line charge density here, you get uh, in a cylindrical symmetry, 
you get this logarithmic potential dependence. And then uh, basically uh, uh, one question that you ask yourself is, uh, uh, or what, what you can ask yourself is uh, the free energy. Is it energy dominated or entropy dominated? Yeah? And uh, you can simply write down the energy because it's just the potential. And to get the entropy, you look at the volume that uh, you would have within a distance R compared to the volume uh, uh, within your cylindrical shell of capital R. And if you do this, you simply find a, a, a relation on this uh, parameter chi, uh, uh, which tells you basically, depending on your line charge density, you are either entropy dominated or energy dominated. Yeah, And this is a very different uh, situation now in the cylindrical geometry compared to the uh, planar uh, geometry, because uh, for the charge plate, you will end up always with something that is energy dominated. If you look at the charge sphere, it will always be entropy dominated. Uh, uh, why is this important? Um, you can now solve again the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, uh, integrate the ion profile, and uh, then calculate actually the uh, fraction of ions within a certain distance. So this is exactly what we previously did with, uh, to get the guy chapman length. And uh, then you see basically that uh, uh, you get this uh, uh, condensation. So you, you find basically all ions within a certain distance R uh, that is uh, uh, finite. Uh, depending on this line charge density. So on, depending on this parameter chi, which is, which is called a uh, Manning parameter. And then this phenomenon is called a uh, Manning condensation. Yeah? Okay, let me skip a bit the details here. I mean, what you will then do today is really uh, uh, throw this problem also into a computer. So you can uh, uh, use all these algorithms that you have learned now. And uh, uh, what you see then is that uh, this uh, condensation obviously uh, differs from uh, what you uh, expect. And this is again, uh, basically because of the shortcomings of Poisson Boltzmann theory. Okay, let me jump to the end. Uh, okay, here we are. So I uh, hope I told you a bit about soft matter simulation approaches, basic concepts, how to cause grain and how you do polymer uh, simulations the Boltzmann theory and how you derive uh, cap differential capacitance and why actually this interfacial electrostatics matters a lot here. And then uh, very briefly, we talked about the ion condensation. Now we can have coffee, but we learned the better symbol for coffee is actually this one. And uh, then we could have some questions if you like.